This is CBC Here and Now. And so in the beginning, they were a little bit more aggressive. I mean, they were hissing and barking when you, you know, it happens to get close to them. Dozens of seals in Roddickton Bide Arm on the Northern Peninsula. Tonight, the mayor is asking DFO for help before they die. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Dozens of seals have descended on a community on the Northern Peninsula. The mayor says her town is inundated, that harp seals are popping up in parking lots, backyards, long main roads, and appear to be trapped. Sheila Fitzgerald says she's never seen so many seals come ashore. About 40 or more are waddling along the streets of Roddickton Bide Arm. The mayor says they came in from the frozen harbor and are not able to find their way back to sea. And while the Department of Fisheries and Oceans says it's not uncommon for harp seals to show up on land this time of year, Fitzgerald worries the seals won't survive. We've just had a big snowfall. Everything is, is snow and ice and salt and sand on the road. And these seals are blending with the road. So during dusk and dawn and throughout the night, these seals blend with the road that you know, motorists are having a hard time to avoid hitting the seals. They're in the road. They're in people's backyards. They're in driveways. They're in entryways going to businesses. DFO says the dozens of seals that have settled in the community are juveniles, that younger seals typically travel in groups, and that could explain the high number. DFO says it usually deals with single cases of seal rescue, and it plans to meet with scientists in the coming days to explore options. In the meantime, the department cautions residents of Roddickton Bide Arm to steer clear. For the most part, they're not aggressive, but they can be if, if approached. The best thing you can do for them is just let them be on their way. And as I say, unless they're in an area where there's either a, there a danger to people or, or to themselves, your best bet, enjoy the view and um, leave them alone. Coming up in 30 minutes, my complete interview with the Roddickton Bide Arm Mayor, Sheila Fitzgerald. Well, the weather is causing a bunch of travel delays. Tonight's Marine Atlantic crossings between North Sydney and Port Basque are canceled. Marine Atlantic is hoping to sail tomorrow morning. Air Canada and WestJet both have travel advisories for parts of Atlantic Canada that could affect flights. So you're going to want to check with your airline if you think you are going anywhere. So let's bring in here now's meteorologist Ashley Brawweiler for some expertise on this to find out just what is going on out there. Well, if you're wondering why those ferries are canceled, take a look at some of these numbers. 152 kilometer per hour gust was recorded uh, for those lace sweat winds, and that is what's headed towards the Rec House area. Already seeing those double digit or triple digit rather uh, wind gusts for the Rec House area. We're expecting to see winds close to 160 kilometers per hour through the night tonight, uh, and that's all thanks to a system that's already bringing a mess to the maritime provinces. It's already bringing that snow to the southwestern portions of the province and will continue as we head through the night tonight, but here's all those warnings. So wind warnings along the coast down through Bergio Ramia. We're looking at gusts between 100 and 130 kilometers per hour up through the northern peninsula. That's a blowing snow advisory and then the mess for the Avalon, Clarenville and Bonavista. Some significant freezing rain on the warning are on the way tonight and into tomorrow morning. I'll have the timeline and the details on your forecast when I come back. The St. John's Farmer's Market is floating the idea of expanding to Thursday nights, but there's another market that operates on Thursday nights, and they say the competition wouldn't be fair. The St. John's Police Officer's criminal trial is on hold. The pause comes after Constable Joe Smythe's lawyer requested a directed verdict from the judge, effectively asking him to dismiss the obstruction of justice charge Smythe is facing. Here now is Mark Quinn joins us live from our newsroom. So Mark, we've been covering this trial all week. What does this latest development mean? Well, Debbie, this latest development means that this case is on hold for almost two more weeks before we get a decision. Uh, we know that Constable Joe Smythe is being accused of writing traffic tickets that are false. Uh, he's, for that reason, facing his charge of obstruction of justice. And today his lawyer in court asked that that charge be thrown out. 
Now, it all stems back to a traffic stop in May 2017. Smythe issued four tickets, traffic tickets to a motorcycle driver. Those tickets were challenged and dropped. Now, one ticket was for driving through a red light, but video from a camera, camera on the driver's bike shows the light was clearly green. Today's Smythe lawyer, Jerome Kennedy, said Smythe clearly did make a mistake, but he's also arguing there's no evidence that Smythe intentionally issued false tickets. Ken Kennedy has effectively asked the judge to dismiss the charge. Now, Crown lawyer Lloyd Strickland disagrees. He argued Smythe was out to get the driver he ticketed in 2017 and clearly made an egregious error when he wrote those tickets. Now, Smythe was investigating a driver who evaded arrest a month earlier, and Strickland said, quote, Smythe was clearly looking for this driver, and the first time he encountered him, he writes a ticket that involves an egregious error. Now, Judge Mike Madden says he needs some time to consider this application. He's expected to give his decision later in January. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. In national news, anger among employees of General Motors in Canada is growing. Workers at the plant in Oshawa, east of Toronto, stopped work again today. Their protest began yesterday with a wildcat sit-in. I want to thank you for putting your tools down and showing General Motors that we are not about to take this land down. This is video provided to CBC News from inside the Oshawa plant. Unifor, the auto workers union, says members staged their demonstration after General Motors confirmed the plant will close at the end of this year. The union also posted a video on Twitter showing the empty plant floor and saying the assembly line was down. Unifor's president, Jerry Dias, says the organization has planned a mass demonstration in Windsor for Friday. Well, it's a chance to build political party momentum or choke it. The Prime Minister has set February 25th as the date for by-elections in three federal ridings. The by-election in Burnaby South in B.C. gives NDP leader Jagmeet Singh the chance to finally become a member of Parliament. He's going to face Conservative Jay Shin, Liberal Karen Wong, and People's Party candidate Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson. Another seat up for grabs is in York Simcoe in Ontario. That one's been vacant since the retirement last September of Conservative Peter Van Loan, who you just saw there. The third one involves that guy. Uh, the election is going to be in Outremont, Quebec, and it was vacated by former NDP leader Tom Mulcair. Was Thursday night big enough for two markets? Well, that's the question that the operator of the night market called out the St. John's Farmer's Market on on Instagram. At issue is the Farmer's Market's plans to expand its schedule and how that could impact the other smaller markets in the metro area. Here now, Zach Gowdy has the details. I'm Anthony Germain, live at the St. John's Farmer's Market, and it's not just for weekends anymore. Since the St. John's Farmer's Market relaunched in its big new building, it's been a big hit and people want more. In the most recent issue of The Overcast, the market's operators hinted at plans to expand its programming and open on more days of the week. We're kicking around the idea of a food-focused evening market on Thursdays or Fridays, but the Thursday part caused a stir with the operator of another local market. Right now, a literal feeding frenzy at the night market in Mount Curl. The night market began this summer and ran successfully through the fall, operating mainly on Thursday nights. When organizer Erin Ballot opened the overcast, she didn't like what she read. So I was pretty shocked that they would consider overlapping when we have really the same demographic of people and a crossover of vendors. I'm already booked to do every Thursday from June to August with my night market. A survey posted on the Farmer's Market Facebook page also referenced the possibility of expanding into Thursday nights. Ballot says this town isn't big enough to share the date. They've received a, a lot of municipal funding for their facility, and I think that that does give them a, like a social responsibility. On Tuesday, Ballot called out the Farmer's Market on Instagram, saying, you shouldn't copy me. I don't have millions in funding or any employees, but I made something great, and I hope you will respect that. We didn't even know this was a conflict until it, it was on Instagram. At the farmer's market, organizers say they were taken aback by the post. It didn't mean to encroach on someone else's turf. 
there needs to be a little bit more communication between all of the ongoing market organizers because right now we would have no way of actually knowing when markets were planned from other people because those are personal private ventures. We certainly don't want to be perceived as being, you know, coming in and, and bullying over somebody ever. At the same time, there are only so many days in the week and the community of local markets is expanding. Anstey says a monthly meeting of organizers or something along those lines could help them all collaborate rather than compete. We're all in this together and unfortunately sometimes there, there has been overlap um, and unfortunately sometimes there probably will be again. But we are a part of this community and we want to continue to be a, a, a positive influence in this community. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's been a cold and snowy winter so far, but what does the rest of the season have in store? Well, it might just be in this book. I'll have all the details coming up on here now. This year's fire at the mill manager's house here on the Grand Falls House property means the entire plan for preservation needs to be rethought. I'm Garrett Berry here in Grand Falls, Windsor. I'll bring you that story coming up on here and now.
Welcome back. Well, here on the Avalon, some people wondering how much salt they're going to need to put out tomorrow. <sighs> Possibilities, a lot of ice. Yeah, it does look like it's going to be a messy day tomorrow. Um, you know, we're looking at quite a bit of significant freezing rain overnight tonight. But if we take a look at the temperatures, that's why we're going to see that because we're going to sit around uh, or at least below zero through most of the night tonight. And eventually these temperatures are going to climb towards the morning hours as the system moves in. So you can see uh, at the satellite radar right now where snow is moving in for the southwestern portions of the province, but down into the maritime provinces where we're seeing these pinks, uh, that's freezing rain and ice pellets. And that's exactly what's headed our way uh, into the overnight. And it extends all the way back through into um, parts of Quebec as well. And that's exactly what's headed our way through the next 24 to 36 hours. So uh, even more so, the winds have already uh, climbed to 117 kilometers per hour for the Rec House area and will continue to strengthen as we head through the night tonight. And that's why we have uh, Environment Canada has those wind warnings in place. The Rec House area will likely see gusts close to 160 kilometers per hour through the overnight and then gusts along the west coast and Burgio Ramia looking at uh, about 100 and 130 30 kilometer per hour winds. Now they will ease towards the morning hours, but still looking at quite strong winds tonight. And then a blowing snow advisory up through the northern peninsula, including the Straits, and then that freezing rain warning, as I've been mentioning, for the Avalon, Clarenville, and Bonavista. So if we take a look at the future tracker, we can see that system, this warm front, uh, make its way across the province, or at least through the island tomorrow. And then into the morning hours is where we're going to see that best chance of that freezing rain. Then it's going to change over to rain for the Avalon and see quite significant amounts with that. And it should be all snow up through Labrador with the winds increasing. So blowing snow expected into the afternoon hours with gusts between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. See a little bit of a break into the afternoon and evening hours and then a potentially even more freezing rain later on in the evening. So here's a look at the forecast for tonight. Again, those strong winds along the west coast, but look at these temperatures climbing through morning to about minus three for Grand Falls, Windsor, St. John sitting at about minus two by the time tomorrow morning rolls around and then those winds will eventually pick up. Right now I'm going to sit uh, around southeasterlies between 40 and 70 kilometers per hour tonight and then strengthen even more so into the uh, afternoon tomorrow. Up through Labrador, generally just looking at that chance of flurries tonight, that rain or rather snow will make its way in tomorrow afternoon. The Straits will see some blowing snow through the night tonight with those strong southeast winds. So here's what I'm thinking snowfall wise. 10 to 15 centimeters is a good bet for the northern portion of uh, the island up through Labrador and the northern portions of Labrador 5 to 10 centimeters. Otherwise, we're looking at a snow ice pellet mixture through the night tonight. Changing over to freezing rain potentially could see about 5 to 10 centimeters before we do see that changeover. And then the avalanche on Buren Peninsula, Clarenville, Bonavista is where we'll see snow ice pellets to start. Trace maybe five centimeters and then that heavy freezing rain into uh, the morning hour. So it does look like it will be quite messy. Eventually, those temperatures will climb up above zero. So here's the metro when I'm thinking uh, by the time the afternoon rolls around tomorrow, snow or rather morning hours by morning. Ignore these numbers. It wasn't supposed to move forward, but uh, overnight tonight, 3 a.m snow ice pellets over to freezing rain in the morning. So between I'd say uh, 3 a.m. to about 8 a.m. is when we'll see that freezing rain and then eventually changing over to rain. So here's a look at your forecast through the day tomorrow. We're looking at temperatures reaching five degrees. That's why we're going to see that temperature uh, or rather everything change back over to rain and those winds will eventually ease and then stay quite strong through the West Coast and then up through Labrador. It's a snowy day with about five to 10 centimeters on the way. Wow, lots, lots going on. What Woo! a mess. A yeah. glass of water. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's going to look a little bit messy tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's for sure. been a strange winter already. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's definitely has been. It's been pretty snowy so far, and uh, that's just what Doyle's Almanac has predicted. And uh, Robert Doyle, this is his fourth year that Robert Doyle and Gus Fanning have published their local weather guide got one right and here, right? storybook. I do. <laughs> I have one here. Yeah, and uh, I met up with both of those authors yesterday. Okay, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> so what do you think this year is going to be like? Well, uh, it is an El Nino year, which we use as our background climate state. And then uh, we do our extended forecast. So generally, it would give us a milder winter, which unfortunately also means more rain and more snow. What do you use to predict so far in the future? I take all the uh, existing data that's in the uh, 
Canadian uh, database, you know, for all the weather stations on the island and in Labrador. And then uh, I build either an El Nino scenario, La Nina scenario, or a normal year, and that's where we get our background state from. An El Nino year simply means? Uh, you got that warm pool situated in the Pacific, and uh, because of that, it sets up this atmospheric wave train that can impact the weather all across Canada and the United States. So Gus is clearly a weather lover just like me uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, you're more into the heritage side of things and you've included this in the book. Can yes. you tell me a little bit more about that? Why? Yeah, well I guess the, the Almanac um, uh, started about four years ago. Um, my grandfather, Gerald S. Doyle, he used to, he was a trained as a pharmacist a hundred years ago. He used to travel around the coastlines of the province a lot of the fishermen were singing songs and, and singing poems, so he decided to collect all those uh, songs and poetry and publish them in Jerry Lester's songbooks. So I took a little bit of inspiration from that. I always wanted to do a little bit of, of writing about Newfoundland myself. So when Gus came into our pharmacy downtown, we have some heritage uh, display cases. He happened to see an old uh, Dr. Chase's almanac from the 1920s and 30s. And Gus said, look, you know, I, I can do some great local forecasting if you want to do some Newfoundland stories. And so, yeah, we decided to do that. One of the stories in the book has to do with uh, letters like WD on these posts here. We're on Mary Meeting Road in St. John's. There's a couple other of these too. What are they? We actually investigated the story. It started up in Cuckles Cove Road. Um, there's a couple of monuments up there as well. And uh, they all have the WD. And up there is WD-12, WD-14. So this is the third monument that we found. And from our investigations, we discovered that it actually means War Department. Um, so the British military would say, okay, well, we own the, the next 12 or 14 feet of land from this monument. So, like, for example, in Kitty Vitty, they wouldn't have, like, fishermen who, were, who would uh, build any installations too close to the military. Huh. Yeah. That's so interesting. The amount of the history in, uh, in this area is incredible. Uh, so there are many more stories just like this one in the book and then weather predictions as well. We'll just That's have to right. see how accurate you are compared to what I am. <laughs> well, every year we do put in how accurate we were from the year before. See, that's so, good. Okay. I guess we'll have we got to... our bona fides. <laughs> we'll have to look into that next year for sure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank All you. Right, thanks, Ashley. So we're gonna have to do that with you, I guess, after you've been here for a as year. As soon as I said that, I was like, oh no, <laughs> to verify my forecast, yeah. Well, uh, Robert, Robert Doyle uh, actually gave me a copy of the book and he inscribed inside it and he wrote, snow to your heels. Snow to your heels. Yeah, have you ever heard of that expression never. before? Yeah, it was new to me too. Explain it to me. And uh, he said he hoped that I never got caught in a storm, that it would always be behind me. Ah, yeah. that's kind of a nice sentiment. Yeah, it's kind of mm -hmm. neat, actually. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned. I'll give you a chance to win the Doyle's Almanac. Uh, you'll just have to be the first person to tweet the correct answer on my Twitter account, and that'll be on my next weather hit right, coming let's up. Let's not make it too hard. No, <laughs> I won't make it too hard. All right, perfect. <laughs> Hopefully you're paying attention. <laughs> Drones come in all shapes and sizes. New regulations announced by Ottawa today. We'll get some insight from a local teacher coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A landmark building in Grand Falls, Windsor is coming down. The provincial government says it will demolish the mill manager's house, and that's throwing another wrench into the plans of the Grand Falls House Foundation. Here and Now's Garrett Barry explains. The quite large. It runs way back. These burnt-out remains are still standing, but not for long. Last year's fire dealt too much damage, so the building is coming down. It's now just a piece of earth and a due course in the spring they'll remove the building. The manager's house wasn't really the crown jewel of this property. No, that would be the Grand Falls house which you've just seen come into focus. This, for the heritage lover, has a lot more value. But the mills manager house could be important too. You could have, for example, made money on that building to help pay for this building. Imagine a gift shop or a business startup center. Too late for that now. That is not recoverable. It's uh, not going to be rebuilt. And that asset is now gone, which has made a, a dramatic impact on our, com our foundation. At stake, the fate of the 110-year-old Grand Falls house. <laughs> like a palace, really. You, know, uh, you had your senior management homes in Mill Road. They were, they were quite large. But compared to the so-called workers homes, it was, it was quite uh, a very imposing building. The windows are still in the house. Uh, Built for the Harmsworth family, the newspaper barons, it's one of the few buildings in Grand Falls, Windsor, that stood the test of time. We had a bad habit of tearing down things here, but this one we aim now to keep and preserve and promote. To do that, you need cash. Part of the wrinkle has been that the maintenance of the property is probably close to 100000 a year just to keep it standing. And who has that money? And the town is not quite sure they want to do that without a plan. So I think that we're coming to a point now where we're trying to crystallize that so we can actually take the building and get it open for business. He says the fire is further pressure to get the fate of this property settled for good. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. The federal government has adopted new rules governing the use of drones. Transport Minister Mark Garneau introduced the changes today in Montreal. He says they were motivated in part by safety concerns over drones that were recently spotted near two British airports. It is a serious criminal offence to interfere with the operations of an airport and even more to cause risk to aircraft carrying passengers that are either landing or taking off. So it's a very serious crime, which is subject to not only a fine, but also imprisonment. Under the new rules, all drones must be registered. All operators must pass an online exam and be certified. Owners must be at least 14 years old. All drones are banned from flying higher, higher than 122 meters or within 5.6 kilometers of an airport. The new rules come into effect on June 1st. Well, for local reaction to these new federal drone regulations, I've come to the College of the North Atlantic, where the journalism program here was the first to incorporate drones in their lesson plans. Jeff Ducharme is an instructor here. Jeff, what strikes you as important about today's new regulations? I think, uh, you know, the, it was a responsible approach by the government to these regulations. Uh, one of the interesting things is that they dropped the uh, liability uh, on drones, or they seemingly have done that. Which means? Which means uh, you don't require liability insurance on drones. They, originally, it was going to be anything over 250 grams was going to have to have liability insurance. That seems to be no longer the case. Right. Uh, and I think there was a lot of lobbying by uh, manufacturers such as DJ, DJI. Uh, now the, the other drone makers. The drone yeah. makers. Largest drone maker on the planet. Um, now the other uh, thing that, that has come out of it is they're moving away from um, special flight operation certificates towards enforcement. So from education to enforcement. So it should be interesting to see how they put that into, pri into play. Right. Now you have some fairly strong feelings about different kinds of drone operators. What do you think the, the, the goal here, who, who's this aimed at? Well, unfortunately, what's going to happen is the, the responsible operators, uh, commercial and, and, you know, just the, the hobby flyer, uh, they're already aware of the regulations and they follow the regulations. The people who don't follow the regulations, who I like to call out-of-the-box flyers, uh, the people who just take it out of the box, turn it on and throw it up in the air and go, they don't care about education. They're not going to pay attention to these rules. They're not going to pay attention to what, uh, you know, government is, is, is trying to put in place. And they're going to continue on flying. So it'll be interesting to see if they can actually reach 
these operators who are really only interested in getting likes on YouTube. You call them YouTube cowboys. Uh, YouTube cowboys, yeah. Right. Yeah. The other interesting thing in the regulations, things that I think are fairly obvious, you can't, uh, you can't drone drunk. No. <laughs> Didn't we know that before today? I was pretty. Yeah, that was already in the regulations. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can't transport live animals with the stronger drones. I'm not really sure what to make of that. A lot of people in Newfoundland seem to use these for some of the more beautiful aspects of what it's like to live here. You think of icebergs, rural parts. Will rural Newfoundland be affected by these regulations as much? As long as you're flying within the proper classification of airspace, you're fine. The problem is in, is in St. John's. Uh, when you look at the rules, uh, you know, I believe they upped it to 1.9 kilometers from aerodromes. And it's not just the airport, right? No, it's aerodromes. I mean, for instance, the hospital, uh, the Coast Guard station, uh, any place where a plane or a helicopter could land, any kind of aircraft could land, is considered an aerodrome. And from those aerodromes, you have to be, uh, as I said, I believe the new regulations are 1.9 kilometers, which is just an increase of about of a kilometer of what it used to be. Right. And airports went up to 5.6 kilometers. Crime scenes, disaster zones, where drones give us a point of view that we have never had until drones arrived here. What do these regulations say about that for us in the news business? Oh, they basically said no. Transport Canada said no. They're, they've said you're not allowed to fly. They will put an exclusion zone in place anytime there's any kind of spot news event. Every year that there's any amount of forest fires, what do we see? People launching drones to get the YouTube cowboys, to get that footage and to get those likes. And every time a drone is spotted in one of these areas, they have to land their aircraft. So if those aircraft are landed for half an hour, an hour, how much forest burns while they're sitting on the ground because somebody wants to fly their drone to get a few likes on YouTube? Right. Listen, Jeff, appreciate your insight, and uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks. The, the response from the community is that this is very disheartening to, to see. Seeing seals all over the streets. They've been schlepping around Rockton Bride Arm for about a week now. More from the mayor ahead on Here and Now. Roddickton Bide Arm on the Northern Peninsula has an unusual situation this winter. They say they're overrun with seals coming ashore, something the mayor says she's never seen to this degree before, and it's making some townspeople nervous. The seals started showing up last month, making their way in over the ice. Some seals have now made their way to freshwater streams, while others are showing up very close to homes and 
on the roads. Sheila Fitzgerald is the mayor of Ruddicton Bide Arm, and she joins us via FaceTime. Well, Mayor Fitzgerald, just describe what you've been seeing in town. Well, it's almost been a week, Debbie, since the seals actually came into town. And we think the reason why they're here is that last week we had high winds and we also had high tide. So with that, I think the seals came inside and closer to our town and then the ice formed behind them. So now, in fact, they are stranded. We have two open brooks that are located right into the town. So it's just over the side of the road. And these seals are in these two brooks and are making their way from the brook over the little embankment. They're in the roads, they're in people's backyards, they're in driveways, they're in entryways going to businesses. Um, it's becoming a real concern, the fact that, you know, we have these seals that are in the road and that, you know, we have kids in our town, we have dogs, cats, so on. And here we are like walking around seals. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong idea that, you know, there are so many seals that that we're, we're overrun by seals and can't live day to day. But what I am saying is that when you go for a, rock, a walk down the road, don't be surprised if there is a seal there. You know, motorists are having a hard time to avoid hitting the seals because they, they are actually blending right in and look similar to the road conditions that we have. Mayor Fitzgerald, we've heard that a, at least a couple of these seals have been killed by vehicles. Uh, can you confirm that? Well, I know this morning, I mean, we're a small town of 999 people and it takes less than 10 minutes from one side of town to the other. Uh, that there were two seals that were found that had been struck last night by cars. So we called DFO and they came and they took the seals. We've called DFO repeatedly in the last week and they've been great in terms of their response. If we call, they come and you know, they're, they're encouraging the public to stay as far away from the seals as possible, but it's really hard to do that when they're sitting right in your backyard. They've been picking the seals up, bringing them down over the bank, putting them back into the, the two little brooks that are open here in town. When you see their behavior, are they aggressive? Are they docile? What, what's happening? Well, it's been close to a week now that they've been there. And so in the beginning, they were a little bit more aggressive. I mean, they were hissing and barking when you, you know, if you happen to get close to them. But now they seem like they're getting tired and a little bit more lethargic and so on. Now, with that being said, we still have seals that can still be quite aggressive. So we, we are encouraging, you know, the public and children especially don't go up close to these seals. Yeah, and DFO says it's reminding people that it is illegal to disturb a marine mammal. Uh, what can you say about some reports that they have been chased by snowmobilers? Now, I, I have a witness that myself, but I mean, uh, you know, people are curious. I mean, and they're, they're cute little animals, but they are wild animals. The harbor is frozen. So people are using the harbor to drive back and forth. And the seals are everywhere in the harbor and, you know, close to the edges of, of, of the snow banks that you come in and out of town. It wouldn't be uncommon for, for someone to be very close in their skidoo with, a, you know, by a seal. But in terms of actually running the seals over, look, I have a witness that firsthand. Yeah. For the most part, I mean, the, the response from the community is that this is very disheartening to, to see and to to watch these animals suffer and struggle because now they went from being very active to now being very tired. What is it that you want DFO to do now? Well, we met last night as a council to discuss the issue around the seals. Like we've called and they pick up the seals, they bring them back to the water hole. That's been great. I mean. The, the reality is that these seals now have been here for almost a week. If they were going to make their way back to the edge of the ice where they can survive, get back into the ocean, that would mean that they'd have to, to crawl or waddle their way out for about four to five miles. If they were going to do that, they would have already done it. It looks like that's possibly not going to happen. We're asking DFO, they come up with a strategy to address the concern, get the seals back to where they need to be out in the ocean and away from town. Had this been a whale or a dolphin that was caught in a net, DFO would very readily, you know, come up with a plan to, to cut these animals free so that they could they could live freely in the wild. This is just as important. So we're asking that DFO come in, get these seals, put them in the sleigh, in the back of the trunk, whatever you need to do, get them to the edge of the ice so that they can go on and, and live happily ever after. Mayor Sheila Fitzgerald, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Debbie. A man was moved into a senior's apartment before Christmas, but he wasn't allowed to bring his pet. Now, this story happened in PEI, but it's a situation that could easily happen in this province. Now, his family says they fought hard to ensure that he would live out his days with his favorite feline. The CBC's Laura Meter has more. 
What's the matter? Eric Lapierre says he's much happier now that his cats, Red Edward and Rugrat, are back with him. He says it's ended the depression he felt living in a senior's apartment that didn't allow them. I was just lost without my cats. I didn't feel good. I wasn't sleeping right or anything, but I had them back now for a couple of weeks, and it's just great. I'm sleeping better, and we're all happy here now. He's back to his old self. His personality is back. His family says they had stressed in the housing application he needed to be with his cats, but somehow he ended up in an apartment that didn't allow them. His niece says it took a couple of months to fix the mistake, but they are very grateful the province covered the costs of moving him into an apartment in another building. We did what we had to do. We got in touch with his doctor, got a letter from her stating that he needed the cats basically as therapy and went back to housing. The doctor said the cats are an essential part of his life, his well-being and mental health. Lapierre says many seniors need their pets, and he hopes provincial officials will recognize that for others too. I hope the housing will look into it and do something about it because the elderly people, they need their cats. It's very important to them, and sometimes it's all they have is their cats. He hopes his story will encourage other people to push for their rights to keep their pets. Lapierre moved in just a few days before Christmas. He says it's the gift he thought he would never get. I figured I wouldn't get them back. I didn't think I'd actually get them back. Now he and the cats are settling in and enjoying 2019 together. Provincial housing officials say they cannot comment due to privacy reasons. They did issue a statement saying that sometimes apartments don't meet all a person's needs, but that it is deeply satisfying when that does happen. Laura Meter, CBC News, Charlottetown. Well, here's a view outside right now in St. John's. Not a whole lot happening right now, but it's going to get messy by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. I'll show you that timeline one more time, and then we'll look ahead towards the weekend when I come back. Is that a seal? No. <laughs> Just outside the building? <laughs> Almost four years ago, I became a quadruple amputee. I had a stroke. 
people who have overcome some major life challenges. When I came to Ireland, I was pretty well dismembered. I have bad days and good days. It kind of depends on the day. We're checking back in to see where they are today. This is my story. This is my story. This is my story. A new series on CBCNL starting January 16th. And this is my story. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back. And Ashley, you made a promise earlier. People are waiting. Yeah, they certainly are. Yeah, you've got a copy of Doyle's Almanac, which everybody can see right there, big red book. And you're going to uh, give that away on Twitter, right? So I guess mm -hmm. if you want to win this, and you need to know Ashley's uh, Twitter handle. Oh, I almost dropped the book. Oops, don't uh, do that. I know. A underscore Brawweiler. All right. Yeah. So earlier I told you Robert Doyle inscribed the inside of these book, uh, or inside of this book, some kind words. What did he write? That's what I want to know. It was a four a phrase with four words, and the first correct answer on Twitter wins a copy of this book. All right, so if you were watching earlier, should be able to get that, right? I hope so. I think so. If you're I paying so. attention. Yep. It was nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now to the not so nice. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to show you the timeline again for St. John's Metro because it did go forward a little bit and it was a little bit confusing. So if we take a look at that, we're going to see uh, snow ice pellets to start by about 4 a.m. Between 4 and 8 a.m. is when we could see most of that freezing rain. So it does look quite messy as that temperature hovers uh, below zero. And then eventually those temperatures will climb up above zero to about one degree. So everything's should change back over to rain. And then later on, overnight again, towards the early morning hours on Friday, there's a potential we could see some more freezing rain. Then we'll see those winds pick up as well. So as that system continues to track, you can see there goes that uh, second round of freezing rain overnight into Friday. And then uh, the potential for some more snow expected across most of the island and then up through Labrador as well. We're going to see uh, more snow, more periods of snow continuing through Friday and even into Saturday. It looks like uh, things will eventually taper to flurries across the island and up through Labrador as well. So that's definitely good news there. So here's a look at your Friday forecast. Uh, temperature is going to hover between zero and above zero for central portions of the province over towards the Avalon. Uh, so either a rain snow mix into the afternoon once we get that potential for freezing rain out of the way. Uh, Corner Brook and parts of the West Coast looking below zero. So we're going to see that potential for some flurries. Winds uh, won't be quite as strong on Friday. We'll eventually see those ease and then up through Labrador. Look at these temperatures minus single digits by the time Friday rolls around for most of Labrador Lab City. Uh, still staying quite cold though minus 11. That's above seasonal though for this time of year and we're looking at that potential for some flurries. So Friday overnight there's that snow continuing. And behind it, we're going to see uh, more of that southwesterly flow and the potential for more snow through the afternoon on Saturday along the coast as well. Keeping an eye on that, some heavier snow expected. And then with some gusty winds, could see some blowing snow into Saturday and Sunday. And then through the day on Sunday and into Monday afternoon, things generally clear out. Maybe some onshore flurries along the west coast. Otherwise, generally a cloudy day Monday night into Tuesday. We're looking at another system moving in. We could see the potential for some more snow. So here's a look at the forecast over the next five days. Again, messy tomorrow. Rain, though, as that temperature climbs to five degrees into the afternoon. Friday, rain or snow. And then Saturday, things clear out. We could see the sun peak out Sunday as well with some flurries returning late day. Minus four should be your afternoon high for Sunday. And then Monday returning uh, with that potential for some flurries. Now, for central Newfoundland, uh, snow, ice pellets, slight chance of some freezing rain. Not quite as much as what we're going to see for the Avalon though and then Friday uh, looking at the potential for some flurries zero degrees dipping down into the minus double digits overnight on Saturday and Sunday and then flurries the story for Monday and then Western Newfoundland looking at a generally gray couple of days uh, even into the beginning of next week temperatures slowly dipping into the minus single digits and then up through uh, Labrador nice tomorrow or rather nice temperatures tomorrow, but about 10 centimeters of snow. We're going to hold on to these well above seasonal temperatures through Saturday and then Sunday will dip right back down and into Monday as well. And then same thing for Western Labrador, 10 centimeters on the way up through northern portions, though, uh, looking at closer to five to 10 centimeters. And then for Friday and Saturday returns of that potential for flurries and then Sunday and Monday doesn't look too bad, but cold uh, sitting in the minus double digits. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look at your weather photo when I come back. Deb. 
Thanks, Ashley. An Edmonton father is speaking out after learning the man who killed his two-year-old son is now looking for love online. The convicted man met the toddler's mother through a website, and now the boy's father fears other women could find themselves and their children at risk. CBC's Andrea Hunkar explains. It was a disturbing discovery for a grieving father. The man who killed his toddler while in a relationship with his ex-girlfriend was now looking for friendships online on a dating website called Canadian Inmates Connect. The father spoke to CBC News but can't be identified because of a publication ban. My biggest concern is um, this guy, he's trying to find love on, online and I'm scared that sing, single moms are all over the place and some some of them might be lonely and want to talk to somebody and they, they could be easily ma manipulated by this gentleman. In 2013, TJ Heller was sentenced to life in prison for killing the toddler. But he'd been charged with first degree murder, sexual assault and interfering with human remains. Now, none of that is disclosed on his profile, where he describes himself as a good listener and someone who's close with his family. He says he participates in prison programming so he can stay on the right track. The toddler's father, who is also a former prisoner, says inmates should be allowed to meet people online because prison is a tough place, but not when they've committed a violent crime against children or women. Their charges should, should be known. Right, like if, if they're charged with killing a, a toddler, they should not be on there because most of these women have kids. And if they don't disclose their charges, what happens if he gets out and she vouches for him? He gets early parole and then he does it again. But the founder of the website, Melissa Fazina, told me she can't put restrictions on who has a right to become a member. The website recommends participants use caution and warns that prisoner information cannot be verified. Corrections Canada says it would be inappropriate to comment on a third-party website or a specific offender's case. Andrea Hunkar, CBC News, Edmonton. A Manitoba woman who hid from the Nazis as a child in France fears that Canadian children don't know enough about the Holocaust. And she says if we forget how six million people were methodically killed, a similar atrocity could happen again. CBC's Marina von Stackelberg reports. This Madame Soulier. Memories of the Holocaust are as fresh as ever for Regine Frankel. I never know if the next day we will be alive. Frankel has been sharing her story with school children for decades. She says she was in shock when she recently spoke to a group of students in Winnipeg. There was one class who knew, who had, knew nothing and that was very disturbing because the Holocaust is something not that was past. It's something that you have to learn so that it doesn't repeat itself. Frankel says over the years, she's noticed people know less and less about what happened to people like her. That's what Belle Jarneski is seeing too. She was leading the discussion with those students here at the Jewish Heritage Centre of Western Canada. Jarneski wants schools in Manitoba to include more about the Holocaust in the curriculum, including Canada's role in anti-Semitism. I think that uh, unless we know our own history, uh, for instance, the fact that uh, we had the worst record of any country in accepting Jews who were fleeing Nazi persecution, um, it makes us less, I think, understanding and aware of the refugee situation today. And she says it's especially relevant now. Particularly today when we see the rise of populism, of nationalism, of uh, white supremacy, this is the prime example of the importance of countering that. The Holocaust led to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Experts say it's important today to know about the Holocaust and understand not just why it happened, but how. Well, the Holocaust uh, really shows that when uh, human rights and human dignity are not recognized and not respected, um, the slope can become very slippery and very steep very, very quickly. Regine Frankel says she'll keep telling her story, hoping it won't be forgotten. And even when I talk to you now, I also, it's very painful, but it's necessary. And I just hope that it has some effect, even if three or few of them.
Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Winnipeg. Look at the calm wow. photo. Very zen. Is that beautiful sunset? It's setting. Okay. It is. Yeah. Is that a clue? Yeah. <laughs> Not a great one. No. <laughs> uh, shock, well, it is beautiful. It's Reminds sandy. It's sandy there. Sandy. Sandy. Uh, All right. Northern base. No, can't be. No, I, I don't think. Hills are too high. Aren't no, they? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You actually. give up. Okay, no problem. I'll tell you where this photo was taken when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. So, ever wonder how many donairs you can eat in one sitting? Apparently, people... You're asking me that question? Yeah. How many do you think? <laughs> At least one more than you, Ms. Cooper. <laughs> uh, if you've been thinking Five, about how many, four, you don't have to wonder three. anymore. Watch this. One. That's 23-year-old oh Joel Hanson. He kicked off the New Year in Halifax. He's in great shape. He's been uh, training for downing this. Downing 19, yes, 19 donairs in less than an oh. hour. And it might oh, just be gosh. a world record. I, I find these very disturbing. Where's he put Anyway, him? he did it live on YouTube where he got hundreds of views. And Hanson isn't done yet. He's now entered a 10-pound burger-eating competition in Moncton. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, each donair that he just wolfed is about 8 bucks a piece. So this stunt actually cost him more than $150. Oh, no. I'm sure. After I ate that many donairs, I would never touch another donair. I was thinking, you know what? In 2019, my New Year's resolution. <laughs> oh, gross. Anyway, yeah, I, I couldn't do it. Anyway. The winner. Winner. Before we go. Yes. Uh, first person to answer it was, uh, we have it there yet, Joan uh, Sears. Yep, mm -hmm. she won this awesome almanac. Congratulations, which is cool. Joan. Yeah, lots, and the answer was? The answer was snow at your heels. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Very good. Nice and you got a, a lot of people uh, contacted you, so that's, that's great. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely good. There's now, the weather photo. And you gave such a I great did. clue, and now people in Burgio are insulting me on Twitter for being an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sunset Sandbags, Sandbags oh. Provincial Park. Yeah, Julie Bra uh, Beg sent us that photo. So thank you so much for yeah. sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to Forgive us, Burgio. <laughs> Forgive us. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for being here, everyone. See you tomorrow. Good night.